Carlson tournament is bringing sensible decks. But I felt that he was the best player we've seen so far. Uh, I thought he played almost flawlessly in the things we saw. Interesting. As you see, um, Yuya versus Zenith. Oh yeah, versus Zenith, in fact. Oya versus Zenith, indeed, is our matchup on the deck, and they are not messing around. They're getting straight into it now, he says, after talking inanely for the past seven and a half minutes or so. But it is going to be Druid versus Hunter, Fandral and Living Roots in the opening hand for Oya, just missing that little bit of ramp to tie it together. The Hunter, fairly aggressive start, but abusive sergeants need to be paired with friends. They're not things that you just kind of want to slam on their own. Love to be able to get those uh, Fiery Bats or Argent Squires to be able to pair with these abusive sergeants. So uh, not the easiest of mulligans for either player, I'd say. Yeah, and it's interesting to me that the, the more aggressive Hunter is slowly but surely sneaking back into more and more events. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's causing that to happen? Because I don't think anything's really changed in terms of the Hunter cards. I mean... A hunter deck at this point is is Call of the Wild and twenty eight other cards, right? I mean, sure. that's that's where your power lies, and even beyond that, like a, a lot of the the mid game of the deck is consistent. You know, your your infested wolves are in there. Almost everyone is back to running high mains now as well. Mm -hmm. um, so your your choice of early game package kind of comes down to whether you jam your deck full of all the three twos. Um, all the two mana minions as well. So you play like Kindly Grandmother, Huge Toad, and King's Zelic and really load up on twos. Yep. Or whether you go for that that tempo opener with the Argent Squire Abusive Sergeant Direwolf package. Um, and honestly, it's just kind of a flavor pick and it's just kind of a matchup pick. If, you, if you're going to be just like beating up on control decks, you'd rather have the big pile of three twos. Yeah. Whereas for the the early board contesting matchups where you know you might have to trade into one threes and three twos from your opponent, that's where Squire Direwolf Abusive Package really comes into play. Yeah, and I think that, I don't know, I just see, it's interesting that more and more people are going with this slightly more aggressive package. Maybe they're just finding it more consistent. Obviously, when you start to go lower and lower in mana cost, you just survive through to that turn eight and turn six, those key turns a little bit longer. Maybe people are finding that more interesting. Because yeah. the, other, the other build, if you don't get that Houndmaster, then quite often it just falls apart rapidly yeah i agree i mean there, were, there was a period where um hunters were were putting doomsayer in their deck just to try and skip that period mm -hmm. of the game entirely um and i think players have realized that it's more consistent if they just you know try and basically use the same early game package as everyone else is using which is argent squire abusive sergeant those two cards just kind of go together perfectly um so if hunters can pack that in as well and then you know, use that to sometimes compete with zoos and tempo mages in terms of opening, then their mid game and late game just kind of spirals the game away. Right, and Oya going, Oya, you, yeah, Oya going for this very early uh, mana ramping here. So sometimes draw cards with that, but he's decided that he's going to be fine because of this ancient oh. in his hand. Yeah, no, no, with, with with both nourish in hand, the first one almost always is used to ramp. Yeah. Almost every single time. And then you the just use one, The second one can be used to refill, exactly. Yeah, okay. And uh, this is going to be interesting how this progresses now because this Ancient is going to eat a deadly shot at some point in the future. Yeah, unless and... you can pick up, say, like a Living Roots to go along with it. That's actually a pretty common thing about the matchup that you do try and play. You use Living Roots, which is kind of a low-value card some of the time once you get into the late game. It, you know, it's exposed to unleash the hounds a lot of the time. So pairing it with like a huge taunt actually serves the double purpose of protecting your living roots from unleash the hounds and protecting your huge taunt from deadly shot. Um, so yeah. norm in, in a lot of situations, druids will be trying to pair those two cards together. And druid, I've I've, I've mentioned this more the times than I probably should today, but I feel it just plays from the top of its deck so well if it has that mana available to it. Oh yeah. Uh, like we're seeing here, we just go as a drake into another card. And yeah, you, you've got that cycle with Wrath, Azure Drake's Nourish. There's more, there's more card draw than is instantly obvious. Yep. And yeah, even this Blood Mage is going to be yet another card picked up. And you don't need to pick up that many cards when your removal package is, is at least half decent and your minions are huge. Absolutely not. Uh, Zenith now might just be considering the, the relative merits of uh, the Deadly Shot for Tempo yeah. here because that, that Drake is, is kind of irritating to him otherwise, but I think he, he knows that the, the bigger threats are going to keep on coming here, so he's just going to go ahead and trade and not you know bank on the tempo of that Misha to, to push him through, which, to be honest, it was, a, it was a lot of tempo moving forward, right? I think the thing mm. holding him back there 
is that he had the he, he didn't have a tempo play available to him to drop another minion without using the coin. And if he'd have had to use the coin, he then couldn't coin high main the next turn. So if he had one more mana available to just squeeze in an extra minion, I think we might have seen that deadly shot come down. But holding onto it here is looking pretty wonderful for him as he's met with the Ancient of War here. And uh, Zenith is going to go through the motions of considering the rest of his turn. But that deadly shot is happening almost certainly. Right, I think that was incredibly well dodged there, actually. Uh, just like you say, that extra mana possibly saved him, but yeah. you know, even then, Deadly Shot hit you for four, have a 4-4 four, four in play, still feels like a good play. And I, I think he's done well there to be now in this position. His reward for his patience is he's taking over this game in a hurry. Yes, he is. And Kindly Grandmother developed alongside. Looks like he's just going to go ahead and coin out the Abusive Sergeant. No, turns it down in the end. So just going to rely on his high main here. And I, I, I kind of like this. Like The Abusive Sergeant, one of the best tempo cards in the game. So by holding on to the coin here, he can uh, tie his high main in with a tempo swing with the Abusive Sergeant in the same turn. Mm -hmm. And then that can just be particularly crushing. You know, it's, it's a... An Azure Drake or a Maya Keeper or something was to hit the board here. Even a 3-5, you know, one of the high-value 3-5 yeah. minions he can use to trade with the Infested Wolf. Also good to get value out of that Grandmother if he does play a 3-3. And also keeping the coin means that if, if he gets the Call of the Wild, he can play High Main into Call of the Wild. Yep. So plenty works. of reasons not to just put a 2-1 on the board right then. I like it. And Uya is... His hand just not looking ideal right now. He can just drop an 8-8, eight, eight, but the 8-8 eight, eight is... It's, it's, it's just going to be a little bit slow in this situation. Hunter has too much life, honestly, to be engaged in a race situation. Um, so Oya has to really consider his options and think whether this 8-8 eight, eight is going to have the initiative on the board that he needs or whether he needs to cycle through his deck with the Nourish and try and pick up more removal options to deal with the board that's in front of him. And the board that, honestly, is only going to snowball from here. Yeah, and I mean, it seems incredible to say there's an option to not play the high main here. There's also the option to play the high main and just ignore the fact that eight eight's there for a turn. And just yeah, play high main, hit face, and then next turn all hell breaks loose. Yeah, what I, I mean, how well protected are you against spell damage swipe in that situation? That's always right. the consideration, and it's not terrible, right? Like the eight eight goes into the high main. And then what gets swiped? The 3-3 three, three body of the wolf? So there's 1-1s one, and a 3-2 left over from the respective death rattles? Yeah, not... I don't think he minds that. He gets value out of his wolf, his dire wolf anyway, if that happens, into the yeah. grandmother. So It's just not terrible, is it? So, yeah, I like this. Just... And the other play is really susceptible to swipe. If you, if you pile out a load of uh, dire wolves and abusive sergeants and give the giant like double wind fury or something, yep. bad things happen. So Fandral picked up, does have Fandral Nourish, but the uh, the impact of Fandral Nourish has been lessened, but it's always at least beneficial because you basically get to play a three mana Nourish because you get the two mana of ramp back as well in mm -hmm. full crystals straight away. So it's usually beneficial to do it even in the late game. Um, picks up the Raven Idol, but this is going to need to be something spectacular. Scenarius is not bad. Mark of the Wild is not bad. Swipe isn't bad here either. Don't think we're going to be seeing Wisps. Yeah, he's going to work out if he's on the Yog. If he's on the Yog plan, he's just a case of which, when the Yog is planned <laughs> that he's going to have to work out. And mm -hmm. I feel like it may even be next turn. He doesn't have long to live. He has less time to live than he expects as well, but... Well, I mean, he. I think he's he's quite happy to put his opponent on a kill command at this point, right? And and one kill command is basically almost representative of that entire hand of damage that he has right now. So, okay. Yeah. Um, I think he he's 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 reasonably expe expecting the the level oh of damage. That's <laughs> oh dear! Oh is the only way I can sum that draw up. That is huge. So ten damage on board. Howlmaster adds two. Direwolf adds two. Direwolf adds two more if he coins them out. Hero Power can substitute for either of those Direwolves if he wants to go down that line. Which means he is not quite there yet. No, but he's in a position where... I mean, the reason he's going to take a long time on this turn is to find out what board state he wants next turn. He has so many two-turn lethals that you know, how he goes about that is irrelevant. But he, what he wants to do is make sure his board is as stable and comfortable against Yogg and against things like Swipe and Wrath. Yeah, uh, it's actually... 
it, it's it's fairly irrelevant, honestly. I mean, you might as well play the Houndmaster because it actively adds stats to your board, right? It's actually yeah. increasing the toughness of the things, making them harder to remove. But often in situations like this, the, the rule comes down to use your situational damage now while the situation is right for it mm -hmm. and keep your non-situational damage back um, so that you can use it freely whenever. But it just all of this damage is situational right now. So... He's, he's coming down to the point where it doesn't really matter, so he just goes ahead and just jams the Houndmaster for, for maximum value on the high main. And This is looking like a bit of a mess here, but the, the spell damage swipe now a lot more appealing than it was on the previous turn. In yeah. fact, it's now a full clear. Yep, going to put the, one, one, uh, the face into the grandmother. Yep. And then clear everything out up and hope he doesn't die and whoa. at the moment that hope will be whoa 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 whoa, 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 whoa. so he's not uh, he moon I, think firing? Oh, I think there's an arcane giant player yeah there's the arcane giant player available if he uses the moonfire sure. instead he can tempo out the arcane giant this is actually just a lot better yeah that's fine guys hold tight so now we have an 8-8 racing a hero power that is what this game has come down to. And just more situational damage picked up from Zenith. These are the early game cards that he wants against the board struggle decks, the zoos and the shamans. These are not the things that he wants to be picking up when he wants to be just peeling that call of the wild at the top of his deck. And this is why some people play tracking in that one slot. Oh, yes. I want three more chances at call of the wild right now. Yes, please. Yeah, I mean, when when the level of power discrepancy in your deck between an average card and Call of the Wild is as high as it is, by which I mean Call of the Wild is just so much better than the other 28 cards in your deck, then playing tracking makes a lot of sense because the rest of your deck be damned, you just want to hit Call of the Wild every single game. Right. Okay, so... Well, he's got to be careful. Obviously, he's got so many ways of just dying to... Yeah, quick shot to call the wild off the top. Uh, quick shot, I'm assuming, will kill him a lot of the time, by the way. Obviously, it's not 100%. And do we just see Scenarius come out here and with two? Right. It's, it's kind of nuts, but he has no way to remove the second 2 2 from the board here, which means he will die to a kill command. If kill and command Yogg is, is just drawn. way too dangerous in a position where you think he might be winning. Yeah, Yogg is absolutely too dangerous. Uh, I believe he has to trade a 2 2. Well, he doesn't have to trade. Well, if he doesn't trade, then Unleash, Unleash becomes lethal. Unleash kills him, correct. Yeah. So I think he I think he has to trade here. And he has Maligos in hand. That gives him extra outs in terms of winning the game next turn. But he may just decide, look, you've got one draw. I'm going to hit you in the face and put it out there. Unleash kills him either way, actually. Okay, in that case, you should go face. Yeah, because even if there's only one dog alive, remember the dogs are doing two damage. Yep. So two dogs trade in, and then the dogs go face. The the actual wolf goes face for two. The dog that slid over goes face for two. So and it is correct to lower two. the amount of turns left. Yep. By hitting face, and that's what's happened, and that's going to work for him. And yeah, um, the emote came out there from Zenith. I'm going to assume uh, that was a well played. Uh, it could have been anything. I have literally <laughs> no idea. I'm going to assume Zenith is a nice guy and just tossed out the well played there. And you can see the uh, the relief, the, uh, the the release of the all that built, built up anxiety from Oya there. Very, very tense first game. And he is the one that's going to come out on top, picking up an all important win for his Druid uh, against a deck that is uh, pretty adept, honestly, at beating up on Druids. Yeah, I, I do think that Druid is um, understated sometimes against Hunter. Mainly because you get the chance to stabilize and feral rage. Uh, none of which happened in that game. No. But And you... also the, the Mali Druid is generally cutting a lot of feral rage. Like they they are yes. cut, they are making room by cutting the three mana spells. So normally, you know, it it wasn't that long ago that we were seeing three copies of those spells in the deck. You know, like two feral rages, one mulch, or yeah. the other way around. The Malagos list generally plays one. Like one mulch or one feral rage. Yeah, and that's a big difference, obviously, because you take away that. That eight armor is a massive stabilization option and a massive early game against something like an animal companion as well. Yes, but... yeah. I, I think more often it has saved my skin just by slapping a Misha on, on turn three than it has by gaining me life against Hunter. But in general, people are finding that you're not on three mana often enough to get really good yeah. efficiency out of that number. Yeah, agreed. Turn yeah. three is the number one turn you want to skip as a Druid player. If 
you see that amount of mana come up, you have failed as a druid, and you should feel bad. <laughs> I feel bad whenever I play druid, because I fail every time. As we see, a matchup we've seen a few times before now. Yep, this is going to be the Dragon Warrior up against the Tempo Mage, and I am immediately curious as to the particular build that Zenith is packing, because we have seen a huge discrepancy and straight away, I knew I liked this guy. This guy wants to kill people. Wow. Like, this is the list that we like. Just packed out, curving out of Firelands Portal and then the Yog. Plenty of damage, all the early game aggression. No tomes in sight. This is the tempo mage I like to watch. You're such a tome hater. And I'm with you. <laughs> I was like, hang on, are you actually gonna gonna defend this card? No, I'm not gonna defend it. Traveling book, I'm not so sure, but Tome, I'm I dislike the fact you play it on turn five and do nothing. Mm -hmm. Or you get to the end game where you're winning anyway and then have time to play it. Again, I think Cabalist Tome is a potentially strong card in a control mage deck that is not right. yet showing results. Um right. again, I just I just don't think it has a home in this deck. I mean, I don't know if Reno Mage will ever be a thing, but a card that produces three more cards in something like a Reno Mage? Yeah. Sure, I'm behind it. Yeah. But in a game where you want to keep tempo, missing a turn on turn five does not seem to be a way to get tempo. And... I know, that seemed obvious. <laughs> Oya, it does. I, I agree with you. It seems incredibly obvious to me as well. But Oya picks up the Alex Strauss's champion, and he has got the Dragon Warrior death curve working for him right now coin champion into fairy dragon into frothing has the black wing corruptor to back it all up he just needs to pick up another dragon before that turn five and he is going to be mounting the pressure incredibly quickly here against Senate. yeah and this fairy dragon we discussed it earlier uh, in the context of rogue but you know, mage can't deal with that card trivially easy either Nope. Um, even more so, in fact, it doesn't even have SI7 or equivalent to deal with it. It usually relies on missiles or just trading into it, but there's going to be more important targets to trade into in this particular game. Certainly will. Yeah, Arcane Missiles, one of the few outs, and like you said, right now, trading the Blood Mage and Ping against any normal minion would seem like a fairly passable play, but he just cannot do that, can't interact with the Fairy Dragon with his hero power, so... That uh, Fairy Dragon is going to get its licks in this game, and we've seen uh, Fairy Dragon terrorizing some people going all the way back to the first series we cast in the in the wee hours of the morning UK time. Um, one of the very first things we saw was the decision not to take nine from the Fairy Dragon by hitting it repeatedly yeah. with the dagger. That option not available here to Zenith, but the same sort of situation where the uh, the lack of interactivity with the Fairy Dragon is going to come back to haunt him here because this is now just a free trade into the Acolyte. It just can't be pinged. It's just sat there as a 3-1. Yep, Zenith, you know, needed the cards anyway. He had no other realistic option last time unless he wanted to waste mana. But now he has to deal with four mana, dealing with what's going to be an army of frothing berserkers, and they're going to be angry as well. Yep, and Forgotten Torch is not the card he was looking for here. Frostbolt would have been so much better here. Frostbolt ping, Colt Sorcerer, Frostbolt, both would have been valid plays in this situation, but Forgotten Torch not going to get the job done. And this is where you sit there and you work out the math and you hope the Frothing Berserker isn't really about to go completely insane, and then you're sad, because it does. Yeah. And he has <laughs> friends. Yeah, this is, this is the point in time where your opponent draws... Oh. Uh, 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 yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty disgusting. So can he now work out there's no way in hand for Zenith to kill this? In you which should... case, are you suggesting you actually trade your 7-4 into one of the taunts and just kill the uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice on yes. the board? I do not hate that play. If he can if he can definitely, or, or as close to definitely as you can, work out that there wasn't a way to kill it last turn, so there's a good chance he can't kill it this turn, let's just occupy the board anyway. And have this absolutely monstrous threat. Okay, he's just going to hit for nine. I'm fine with that as well. I think Frostbolt is out of your opponent's range. I yep. don't think Fireball is out of your opponent's range. I think you can say that 
your opponents play that turn, Sorcerer's Apprentice, Forgotten Torch, the Champion, and Mirror Image was stronger than just Fireball Pass. Yes. Um, so I can definitely see you still give, having the read that your opponent has a Fireball in the hand. Yeah, I find it hard to ever complain about hitting someone on turn four with your 9-4 minion. It's, right. It can't ever be very wrong. I just wondered if there's a way he could make the read to make the board even more powerful going into turn five. Uh, this is obviously fine. And even if this Sorcerer's Apprentice comes back to bite you here, even if it gets value here by sticking on the board for one turn, it's not going to stick around for long because you have now have picked up that dragon for the Blackwing Corruptor, so you're able to just happily snipe it on curve. And Zen is just going ahead and playing the Azure Drake here. And that frothing is just going straight back downtown for another 11 minimum. Right. What method do you choose here? Uh, you can obviously just play the 5-4, trade in your fairy dragon and hit your opponent for, I don't know, 13. Or you can do this. <laughs> wow. Oh, beautiful. It's like, deal with that tempo mage you had no answers last turn. See what yeah. you what do your worst. Yeah, because because now you're ruling out fireball, right? right? Now now fireball's gone. Now frost uh, frostbolt is gone from the equation already. You haven't brought him up to Firelands Portal Manor yet, so you know that's not in the equation. You know Flame Strike isn't in the equation. Like, what answers are left that he could possibly have? Answer none, and that oh. is a ridiculously quick two zero for Oya. Yeah. On the very micro level there, right at the end, in the in the world of 1%, mm -hmm. uh, I thought it was interesting he decided to draw cards rather than play the portal. Uh, I think that you have... He couldn't play the portal. Oh, okay. That's why he didn't do it then? Yeah. Sure. He could. Uh, he, so he had six mana, so the portal cost six mana, but only after he played the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Sure, I'm just looking at numbers in the corner of the screen and not paying attention, because that's yeah. my job, right? Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Anyway, 2-0, like you say, incredibly fast start. And, yeah, nothing more to be said. Convincing. Indeed. So Zenith now has a very long road ahead of him. But Oya just has to pick up a couple more wins here. But I actually sold a certain deck short earlier. I said that there was very little Warlock representation in this tournament. Oh, and no. all of the Warlocks that are present... Were zoo warlocks. What that is information, it? Lorinda, is incorrect. You're going to make my day sad, aren't you? I'm not. Oh, what have we got? We have a deck that is packing two mountain giants, <laughs> two twilight drakes, two faceless shamblers, two doomsayers, two sun fury protectors. This is not a Reno deck, Neil. This is Hamlet. Wow. So you're having, like, your best day ever. You get Actually, to see Patron yeah. and Handlock, which yep. were your two favourite ever decks, flash back or flash forward into 2016, and you get to cast them both in a championship event. Yep, indeed. Uh, I'm in, jealous. In before that's the deck that's banned for Oya. <laughs> yeah, because we get, like, two seconds to pick up that information, unfortunately. So apologies for that as we see the Hunter vs. Druid the other way around. And this could be huge mm -hmm. for Oya. Yeah, it certainly could. I'm just going to take a quick look at Oya's Hunter list here. He is favoring much the same thing as we've seen, but he's gone for the big pile of two drops plan as opposed to the uh, Argent Squire abusive plan. He's also packing a Tundra Rhino in there in that weird flexible five slot that no one really knows what to play. Yeah, the five slot in Hunter is horrific. Uh, I think that the best straight up actual standalone card is Kodo in that slot. I was about to say, don't say Princess Hua around. I didn't. <laughs> but I might do in the future. <laughs> okay. um, but for some reason, the Kodo plan, if it works, you're behind anyway, and it doesn't really swing that much because the way that decks are sort of spewing two threes all over the board. And the, answer, it... the answer you're searching for here, Neil, is Stranglethorn Tiger. So Stranglethorn Tiger's actual personal PR assistant, yeah. Sottle. Stranglethorn Tiger is just correct. In I am surprised it's not played more, I must admit. I mean, you've yeah. slowly but surely sold me on that card over the last few events. Mm -hmm. And given that everything in the deck struggles on turn five, a five guaranteed, inverted commas, whatever you like, damage spell seems pretty good. 
Agreed, but we are nowhere near turn five yet, and there is a big old pile of removal sat in Zenith's hand alongside an Innovate, so he has the, the chance to make some magic happen. He can go oh. all the way through to Nourish here if he would want to. They're both calling for an looks admin. looks like so. they are both flagging for an admin here. If there is a disconnect, and this, this. is about the time you want a disconnect yes. to happen. You would this much rather it now than turn 10. is why we weren't sure about the one earlier. Because this is what happens when an actual problem yes, occurs. Yes, exactly. Is both players suddenly start panicking and pointing and waving. Just like yep. this. And I don't blame them. And honestly, both people, uh, both players there had perfectly reasonable hands. You know, yes. um, Oya, Oya had a, a strong curve to drop into Animal Companions. Um, and uh, Zenith had his Innovate and he had a, a big pile of removal and a Nourish. So... Both players were looking in, in decent shape to be able to stalemate each other for the for the opening few turns there. So I don't think either player will be too hard done by if a regame does happen. Um, just wondering, are we seeing a reconnect here? Uh, looks like the rope is about to burn out. So I expect we will now see a remake of this game. But again, we are simply rebroadcasting this event. We do have a liaison who's uh, giving us feeding us some information, a uh, liaison at the event in Japan, but. He is a very, very busy man who can only feed us so much information. So we are kind of just functioning on guesswork here as to what's going on. But hopefully we get a resolution to this situation as soon as we can. So I think that casters sometimes do overstate in the interest of saying something, you know, the, the mental aspect of this sort of situation. But there's mm -hmm. definitely something in this particular situation to be said because both of these players will feel they were going to win that game. They don't ever get to know what the other guy had in his hand. Right. So they've only seen their own hand and they will both think, oh my goodness, why did this happen to me right now? Japan, blah, blah, why me? Not like this. Yeah. And so there is definitely the opportunity to tilt after something like that occurs, especially if you're in Zenith's shoes, you're 2-0 down, you thought you were going to win game one, you didn't, and now this happens in game three. So I think there is definitely some aspects of the mental side of the game here where you know, both these players better be on their game because if they tilt slightly here, that's going to be a big problem. Yeah, I mean, we, we saw in the in the previous series, right, a player who went through some adversity with a disconnect situation and it honestly just seemed to tighten up his play afterwards. That that little break and that moment mm -hmm. to refocus seemed to be exactly what he needed. So, yeah, no surprises here. It is going to be the regame. Both players not looking like they have the, uh, the quality of opening hand just yet that they had in the first game. So we're going to see a pretty extensive mulligan here from both players, I'm sure. And as you said... Both players here have the potential to feel hard done by because they both would have liked the look of their opening hands. So if you're Oya, do you keep the deadly shot? That's the only card out of the seven cards that feels like you might want to keep it to stop any potential innovate stupidity happening to you. It's it's possible. Um, what I will say is that if you curve out with this deck, you you know it's, it's not like Zoo where you play a 1-1 one, one on turn one and then they innovate a 3-5 into it, right? Like right. You, you quite often have a 3-2 on the board, at which point, you know, Bow or Quick Shot or Kill Command, like all these things can get the job done anyway. So I like Mulliganing for the curve. And I think, Neil, you have nailed this because look at Oya's face looking at his hand here compared to what he had in the first game. Right. He doesn't seem... I mean, he seemed a little bit fed up already with it. It's strange because he's the guy who's 2-0 ahead. But um, yeah, he's thinking, oh no, now Zen is playing this on turn one. And he needs to just get it out of his head and play Hearthstone because that's what he's here to do. Right, now here is a decision for Zenith. And this is this is illustration number one in you know the game being more than stats because right. making the jungle panther, making just the panther here, sorry, is five stats on the board. Yep, which is what he's Buff gone for. Buffing the two one ones is four stats on and the board. And plays around things like Unleash the Hounds. Exactly. Right. Uh, you know, Fiery token, bats. <laughs> fiery bats, huge toads. So there is merit, right? Like stats are not just stats. The distribution in which stats appear matters enormously. So that's why you saw Zenith even stop and think about that play. Because if Hearthstone was purely a stats game, there's no thought there. You make five stats instead of four. But you yeah. saw Zenith pause and think about whether he'd rather have the two twos on the board. And this is something that... When Barnes came out, people were like it's not a Yeti. Like it was described as a Yeti's amount of stats, yeah. and like yeah, you know, the pro community jumping. It's not a Yeti. It's, it's it's it works differently. But actually, the way things have panned out, Barnes's distribution almost feels better than a Yeti oh. sometimes. Oh, oh, that's a tilter. That is a tilter right there. 
the fiery back connecting to face with those two juicy one ones sat on the board. Right, we've seen a lot of that tonight, actually. Uh, people just shooting face and missing one ones. But yeah, Barnes's stats have actually seemed to be <laughs> split <mind>. into a. <laughs> You're a little bit ahead of the action, by the oh, way. Oh my, so, yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, Barnes's stats seem to be split, especially when he gets a one one and two two twos, into a much better distribution than just a yeti these days because. People are going wider and wider with their boards in general. Yep. No, I, I, I totally agree. But yeah, particularly when your 1-1 one, one of stats comes out in the form of a Savannah Heim. <laughs> sure. That tends to help just a little bit. So just going to plop a teacher on the board here and hope for the best. And depending on how much tidying he chooses to do here, he might just play straight into the deadly shot that Oya chose not to keep, but in fact might end up coming back to pay dividends here. Right, and if you can draw it anyway, then I think not keeping it is definitely the right thing. You'd rather have it on turn sort of five or six than turn three most of the time, apart from that a sort of double innovate craziness situation. Yeah. Uh, Zenith? Um, but again, it's one of those weird situations where, you know, people will naturally call trading the safe play, right? And, right. Yeah, you know, attacking face the risky play, the greedy play. But in this situation, he has exposed himself to Deadly Shot, which is a, a play that just attacking face with all of his minions did not leave him open to. And because of the nature of the high main, this is absolutely as close to perfect as he could hope for on this turn. Yep. And Oya in a really strong position. Just going to nourish here for the ramp and going to curb into that Ancient of War next turn now. And there is going to be a certain uh, rhino-shaped fellow that is going to have something to say about his opponent just dropping a seven-mana minion on the next turn. Because right, this needs dealing with. Yeah. You do not leave Tundra Rhino alive. Like, at your peril going into turn six or turn eight, like, you know, leave that thing alive at your own risk. Yeah. And, or if you have no choice, then sometimes you just have to do it. But... It's going to end badly for this particular Violet Teacher, or it, he's got choice. He can just go face, to be fair, as well. He can indeed, and uh, the ramp play means that uh, Zenith obviously now thinks he's living in a Yog world. He realises with the, the Tundra Rhino now on the board that the, the Ancient of War is not going to be enough to get him out of trouble here, and charging Savannah High Main, the absolute dream. Like, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been tweaking a mid-range hunter deck and thought, hey, let's try out Rhino again, just thinking that this was going to happen every game. And it never does. You uh, never get to do this. You need Oya to practice it harder. The dream. I guess I do, yeah. And, I mean, this is horrible now because, obviously, in the worlds where it isn't lethal next turn, which are not that many worlds... Yeah. You know, Rhino, uh, the high main gets to trade and then it gets the 2-2s to attack. I mean, just all the obvious things. The, the, the guys that are produced from the high main also have charge. It's like it's like Patron all over again from last year. It is. I mean... No like, wonder you look, like it. Raven Idol into naturalize the Tundra Rhino and play an Ancient of War. I mean, that's the only alternative to Yogg. And if your alternative to Yogg is already that ridiculous... You might as well Yog, because you're asking for madness to happen anyway, right? So, but this situation is why Yog originally got a reputation of maybe not being broken. A six or seven spells situation, maybe. Yeah. Uh, where Yog is so much less powerful than 11 <laughs> or 12 spells. And <laughs> Zenith actually sees the funny side of that. And that exact Yog is why people went, what's wrong with this card? It's fine. Yeah. Because yeah, I mean, it wasn't Yog, yet Yog integrated. Right, Yog, Yog was a joke, honestly. Like Yog was treated with the same kind of uh, of derision that we've been throwing towards, like Cabalist Tome, for example. Right. It was like, you know, I thank you to my dear opponent for playing the card Yogsaron in your deck. Thank you for the free win. You know, this this is not a long time ago. This is like two or three months ago that yeah. that was the attitude. And now Yog is almost universally agreed to be, you know, top three most powerful cards in the game, if not top one. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, the reason I make that point is it's because. When you're in that situation, it's worth remembering those times because yeah, your Yog with six or seven spells is so different from your Yog of 11 or 12 spells. Yeah, absolutely agree. And so you mustn't just... I mean, he had to do it there. It was the right play. But if you're doing it as a matter of course to put your faith in the Yog and see what happens, you're doing it wrong. At least on that number of spells. Yeah. So Oya, so far, has swept with his Dragon Warrior. 
his Yog Druid and his mid range hunter. There is one deck left. Depending on what the ban was, it could be the mid range shaman or the Reno lock. Uh, not the Reno lock, the sorry, handlock. the hand lock. My apologies. Um, so, yeah, we will uh, wait and see what the last remaining deck is. Again, we are just working on secondhand information here. So, the bans did not get relayed to us, as of course they do to the casters. I think you can probably just make out on that little screen down the front. There is a graphic on there that I assume has the bans on it that I would love to be able to make out right now. But yeah. I I'm squinting as hard as I can squint, and I just can't make them out. Um, the mid-range shaman, that's a pretty broad description these days. Is it, it um, is. is it totem base? Is it witch doctor base? Is it just fire elementals and good stuff, Alec, here? It is, of... it is low curve. Um, it's low curve, bloodlust, thunder bluff, valiant, basically. Okay. Um, yeah, double spirit clause is in there. Um, I like the look of this list a lot, actually. It's, it's very, very close to what I ended up with when I started messing around with the deck. Uh, Double Squires, one Trog, which I think is uh, something that quite a few people are missing at the moment, but is actually probably the correct way to build it, in my opinion. But it is the Shaman that has been banned. Oya Sottle. Is coming out with the New Age Handlock. Sottle living the dream. Once again, reliving his Hearthstone childhood for the <laughs> second time today. And, I mean, you were one of... The best players of this deck. I know you wouldn't want to say it yourself, but you know the original handlock. You were somebody who put a lot of games in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah just, I mean, just yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, to the part. I mean, you know, I'm not gonna say yeah. Yeah, you know, I was one of the best handlock players. But yes, I, I I have you know thousands of games of this deck. I had I had Golden Warlock before any other class except Hunter because I'm pretty sure everyone just gets Hunter first. Uh, but I had Golden Warlock second, and I think I played like 20 games of Zoo. And then, you know, I must have easily played another thousand games of Handlock after I had Golden Warlock. So, yeah, like, I have a lot of games of Handlock under my belt. Back in the old Molten Giant Argus Healbot, etc. form, as it evolved. As it evolved through the years until Molten Giants were cruelly and savagely torn away from us. Wow. Yeah, those Molten Giants. Uh, people just don't have the guts to go low enough on life to play them, I think, is the problem. Those handlock players, those cowardly <laughs> handlock players who hide behind their big taunts on three health. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, so um, joking aside there, what what is it that makes handlock potentially viable in a tournament like this at the moment? Is I mean, obviously the lack of healing is a big problem. It is. I mean, honestly, I, I wish I had an answer for you, but every experiment that I have had with this deck, it just has come up wanting for me. Um, I And it's not even the loss of the Molten Giants. It's the loss of Heelbot, Sludge Belcher, like these, these mid-game defensive tools. So that this scenario that Oya finds himself in right now, where already he's looking at his life total and saying, right, if that board gets to connect with my face one more time i probably lose right so al already he's had to make the defensive play using one of his big taunt givers and the defender of argus to to find some tempo on the board but talking of nerfed cards that doesn't seem to bother oya um just casually playing the five mana eight eight killer which against druid at the moment is probably a pretty handy card to be fair it doesn't seem too bad yeah and uh Zenith having been able to ramp up here is important because it means he's able to get down his Emperor outside of the Siphon Cell range of his opponent. So that is a very big deal for him right now. And there, unless I'm very much mistaken, there is no way in hand to kill that thing right now. Shadow Flame, not going to help. Right, and this is the um, the eternal, even back in the day, handlock issue of I want to play my Mountain Giant next turn, but there are problems for me to deal with that involve me you know, casting things out of my hand. If you yeah, don't he can get play, turn he, three. He can play one card this turn and still have a six mana mountain giant next turn if he wants to go down that line, but it's almost always next turn, looking at the the state of this board, it's almost always gonna be Sylvanas or Siphon Soul, depending yeah. on how bad the next turn goes for him. Um so I'm <laughs> you know definitely okay with him just trying to load up some stats on the board here. So maybe he can at least contest this Emperor just through raw attrition with the minions that yeah. he has in play. You know the thing you said about how bad this turn goes for him? Yeah. It's bad. It's really, really, really biblically, astronomically, oh, catastrophically, no. and what? continuing to get worse with every <laughs> single moment. Oya is just going to dig himself a hole right now. Yeah, I mean, 
Zenith is just limited by how many spells he can play in 70 seconds at this moment. Yeah. It's um, taking his time like he has done all match, to be fair. I've been impressed with how Zenith's kept things. You know, he's 3 0 down. It's easy to say he's doing things wrong, but to be honest, he's, he's played carefully and steadily. Mm-hmm. And if, if, at times, look the most composed of the two, but yeah, he's just making sure he doesn't mess this up. He's got so many things he can do. It's going to go with the Wrath instead of the Living Roots, which actually suggests to me we're not seeing a Power of the Wild turn. Hmm. Interesting. Is he is going to use the Power of the Wild? But he no, he's going to use the Hero Power instead. Okay, this is this is fine. I I I, I don't really see the world where you cast Power of the Wild without using the Living Roots there instead of the the, the Wrath, but just using the Hero Power so that you can force that five damage through to face. That makes perfect sense to me, but as I said, yeah. just Sylvanas here, contest the board, try and make a mess for your opponent, see if he can sort it out. But just again, look all those glowing cards in hand. Right, and this think, is just game, right? Yeah, just living roots, living roots to face, power of the wild. That is going to finish the job nicely. Yeah, and all you're doing the right thing there, by the way, like if you can't deal with all of the threats, just put down Sylvanas and... Mm-hmm. In the miracle world where you somehow get back into it, that's the way to go about it. But not getting back into it is an understatement in this position. Yeah, that that game was a mess. And that right there is very much my experience with trying <laughs> to play Handlock in 2016. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it just doesn't seem to work from my perspective. So, I mean, I'm happy to be shown something from Oya here, but I'm also really, really fearful that this is now going to be the deck that lets him down. But I hope for his sake. Obviously, he's got this far. This is, again, Conquest format. So he has won games to put himself in this position. And the handlock will have had to have won unless it was banned. So there, he has obviously had success with it so far. But, I mean, it, it just was just found horribly wanting in that game. Yeah, I mean, the Druid just stomped straight through it and never had a chance. In fairness, he had a fairly awkward draw. He drew the, the two protectors and not much else to go with them. No early big things at all, which, you know, that was always something that could happen to Handlock. It's just if those things happened before, it would have other ways out. And now it doesn't have those. Uh, it has been played recently. I think AKA Wonder played it at Insomnia. So it's not a deck that's been completely dead for forever. Did he? Really interesting. Because he was so. he was running with, you know, different Reno Lock variations and Cthune builds and such for a while. So yeah, interesting he that he switched over to Handlock. Straight Handlock. He either went with it or he was going to and changed his mind at the last second. It was one of those two things. So, yeah, we are seeing top players still play around with Handlock and give it a go. Yeah, I know. I, I mean... One of the, I've, I've, I think I've tried to play it on like three different occasions since Molten Giants got nerfed. And the most recent one was uh, Stanadachi, who is um, one of my favorite players in terms of deck builders, um, posted a list on Twitter and said, hey, I've been hanging around like top 100 legend with this deck. Um, and, you know, I, I, I tried it for his list for, I don't know, you know, 15, 20 games or something. And like was like barely holding like 52, 53% with it or something. Right. And so, I, this this just can't be good enough. Like I know I know Stanadachi is a god, but come on, like, this this is ridiculous. And again, I guess Doomsayer here is fine. Uh, you do have to play it incredibly early, like turn one early sometimes against Hunter though. Yeah. And obviously you don't really want to be using that coin, but what else are you really looking for? So you might as well keep it. Uh, refreshment vendor. I don't think you keep. Perhaps you do. Uh it's 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 questionable for sure i mean you're you're never going tap tap mountain giant in this matchup especially since you kept doomsayer which kind Mm -hmm. of rules that out anyway with the coin you have to play a card on either turn two or turn three anyway if you're going to go into the tap tap four drop route you know kind of the classic handlock opening um so the doomsayer doesn't interfere with that too much um but you know bearing in mind that you are probably not going to have enough time to tap into the mountain giant the only four drop in your deck that is better than that refreshment vendor is the twilight drake so you can call it a bit of a greedy mulligan if you like but he was able to pick up the twilight drake itself uh off the mulligan so i guess it worked out okay for him yeah and he's gone with the way to turn for doomsayer plan so probably going to be rewarded here to be honest i mean it's going to get a kill command and die but that's seven damage it's eaten yeah, and this is a, a legitimate seven damage that it's eaten. A lot of people say this, right? Like you play a Doomsayer and worst case scenario, it heals you for seven. Well, yeah. no, because there are cards like Arcane Blast that can hit a Doomsayer but can't hit you in the face. 
Yeah, and sometimes the seven it eats is just seven for minions that just hits you again next turn. It sort of right. gets lost in the wash. But if it eats a kill command, that yeah. is five legitimate eaten damage. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we're going to go ahead and Mortal Coil to cycle here. This fits in with the plan perfectly. And he's actually just going to tempo out the Sun Fury. This is a, a strategy that people did have to be aware of back in the day when you're playing against the really, really fast decks. You know, you had to trust that you had enough Taunt Givers in your deck and just use, in particular, the Sun Fury Protectors to try and contest early game minions, which, you know, back then were Lepanomes and Haunted Creepers, but these days the, the shape of the minions have not tra have, have changed a little bit, but their intentions have not. They still just want to hunt you down. I will hunt you down. And luckily for the Handlock, I guess one thing that is in its favour compared to back in the good old days is... It's not quite as brutal against the Hunter as in that Hero Power Sure. It's going to still be as brutal in some ways, but you're, you're not starting with the same terribly low life total that you might have been back in the day with Undertakers and things hitting you. Well, here's the thing. I mean, generally, the, the faster the Hunter deck, the better your matchup was as the Handlock yeah. player. Um, the, ab the absolute outright Face Hunter builds... You could, you could lock those out fairly easily. If you managed your Molten Giants and your Heelbot correctly, you could lock out Heelbot. Uh, you could lock out Face Hunter very, very quickly and race them back. The the deck that you couldn't beat was just the big, chunky, double shredder, double high main mid range druid. That right. matchup was horrible. So that's basically what these modern hunters are emulating, where instead of you know the shredders and stuff in the mid game, they now have infested wolves. And now they're also just packing call of the freaking wild at the top of their curve which is just <laughs> another card that you can't beat so i don't know dude i think this is probably a pretty torturous matchup again for the handlock but oh, i'm starting end... to spot a pattern in the cards you don't like they're the ones what? that beat your favorite decks all of them <laughs> you, you don't you don't say <laughs> there's <laughs> no bias in there at all he loses to yeah wow <laughs> newsflash guys please people enjoy winning more than losing yeah uh, looks like quick spectator issue here, but I mean, let's play this turn for ourselves. Okay, picking up the animal companion actually makes it pretty straightforward. But let's say that he didn't, you know, thought experiment time, he didn't draw a playable card that turn mm -hmm. to go with the kill command. Develop high main at the cost of leaving Emperor alive or kill command hero power pass? Uh, life total was 20. I'm okay developing high mains, I think. Okay. I think I'm, I agree with you. I'm one of those guys who sits there, and if I'm not sure what to do, close my eyes and hurt somebody and hope it goes away. <laughs> wow. You're a, you're a scary man, Neil Bob. <laughs> and so talking of locking out, though, at least for the short term here, mm -hmm. until your favorite card comes down next turn, you know, yep. this, is, this is a pretty much locked out position. But like you say, Call of the Wild is a thing. Call of the Wild is indeed a thing, and... There is, uh, yeah, he's going to develop the high main, and there, oh, draws the mountain giant this turn, which is probably the worst card in his deck at this point. It's just going to be an expensive, clunky card because, as you can see, the hand lock is a bit low on hand right now. They, uh, they, this is just how you're forced to play against Hunter. You cannot go for the the tap tap into big guy strategy. You have to fight for the board aggressively from turn one. And it looks like it's we're just going to tempo out a BGH this turn. Which that BGH can snipe the first part of the high main next turn against the expected yeah. play, which is Call of the Wild, because the Leoc will buff it to seven, which means your combination of Big Game Hunter and Hellfire are actually extremely effective. But is he setting himself up for a lethal push by doing it this way through the Call of the Wild? Yeah, I mean, that's what he's trying to do, but I don't think it's doing it. Unless he was figuring, you know what, if he's got Call sure, of the Wild, it, I just don't yeah. win. It, to be fair, if there's Call of the Wild, then that high main trades into the 5-7 anyway, so the big game hunter actually isn't a relevant factor. So thinking about it in more detail, it doesn't actually make that big of a difference. So yeah, I'm going I'm going with he his play was to beat the non-Call of the Wild situation. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. Cool. All right. And what do you do? You you siphon the Leoc, or do you find? Oh, of course you don't. You've got Hellfire in your hand. That'd you be help. much better. That'd be the correct yeah. play. You Hellfire, you play Voodoo Doctor, and then you probably lose the game to Call of the Wild number two. Soulfire is risky here. It takes so much expected damage off the board though by removing the last beast. But if you discard either Siphon Soul or Alexstrasza here, because you 
You may just need both of those to win this game. Can you take Soul Fire and not play it? Oof. So then you heal yourself with Alex maybe next turn and then hope to Soul Fire them out the turn after? If you play Alex, you're not interacting with the, with their board next turn, which means how much, you know, do you survive 15 over two turns without doing anything to affect their board? I mean, he's seen one Call of the Wild. It's, it's fair to assume there's not going to be another one. I mean, it's not that fair because we see there is, but... Right, but I mean, like, how master two drop hero power, right? Like, it, it's, it's, it's so easy for the hunter to generate pressure in this situation. Mm-hmm. This decision could very much decide the texture of the game. He's going to give it up. Call of the Wild is going to come in with the extra damage. That is a six damage Huffer coming in and a three damage Leoc, which means he is one damage off lethal. Absolutely going to go through here and deny the life tap. And like I said, Alex Straza here. What does it do? Uh, again, I, I'm going to take issue with your tone of voice, young man. Um, I think... I think... <laughs> Playing oh, around man. the second Call of the Wild would be harsh. I know he can no, still agree, play so Houndmaster plus another guy, but yeah. this was the only absolutely disastrous scenario. I, I didn't mind his play there, I don't think. I I think I would have sulfied on that turn. It is definitely hard because obviously I'm sat here staring at that second Call of the Wild, but I think on average against the amount of pressure I expect to face from my opponent, mm -hmm. um, you know, the line he took beats... A, you know, a pile of burn damage in hand, for example. Or not like a pile, but, you know, like... It beats like an eagle horn, bow, the face, and hero power turn, right? That's what it beats. Because then next turn you can Alex Straza yourself and you're in good shape. Yeah, um, and 15's a lot. I mean, say he plays Stranglethorn Tiger. Let's just give a minion out of the blue for mm -hmm. a decent five drop. Uh, okay, let's say he plays High Main and hits you in the face. Mm -hmm. You heal to 15, and you've got lethal set up for the turn after, so he has to trade. Do you have lethal? Self yeah, you have the eight mana. You have the eight for the Alex Straza and the four from the Soul Fire, and he was on twelve. That's that's why I was suggesting the play. Interesting. All right. Yeah, that does change things. But yeah, so if High Main comes down, then the Leoc is still in play, but you also have that Peddler in play, right? That can trade for the Leoc afterwards. Mm -hmm. so you are just dealing with a High Main. So then, you know, High Main Hero Power is just eight. So it would take more than a Kill Command after that to kill you. Ah. I mean, I guess it's reasonable. It's very difficult when you can see their hand sometimes to it think, is. what yeah, would I, I do if I couldn't see this hand? Yeah, absolutely. Um, because what tends to happen as a caster is you overcompensate. Mm -hmm. I was having this discussion with somebody about a play some time ago, and basically the casters missed a play because they were overcompensating for what they could see. They were saying, well, I know I'm a caster, I know I can see this, therefore it must be so much the other way. And then you realise you're doing that... And it just becomes really difficult to sort of sit there and objectively sometimes in that exact situation where, you know, how much do you value that Call of the Wild, etc. Right. Um, know um, exactly what the players are putting him on. Meanwhile, but, Yeah, damage. distinctions of that one particular play aside, again, we just have to come back to the story of is this Hanlock going to be the downfall for oh, yeah, he's He has just breezed his way through the rest of this series and then just started to come a little bit unstuck with the handlock here. And again, I'm just looking at the interaction between this really aggressive tempo mage from Zenith, about as aggressive as it gets with all the extra cycle and the torches and just saying, you know, how, how does handlock just out heal all of this damage? Right. So again, back in the day, you'd heal back up and then start tapping again and get your advantage that way and try to do that. But this, oh my goodness. This deck is going to put on the early pressure, and then it's just going to burn you down. If you go below 15 with a deck that can't kill somebody quickly, you're just going to lose two fireballs. Yeah. And 3-3 three, three is looking very close to Oya's future here. It is. Um, Not to so mention the really good hand from Zenith. It is really good, um, primarily because he can actually interact with the Doomsayer on turn two. Um, Mana Worm on turn one without basically this exact pile of, of spells to back it up would actually not do too well for him here, but he does have the ability to interact with the Doomsayer here if he would like to. All right, and the key phrase there is if he would like to. It's quite a few resources that gives you a 4-3. That seems decent. It does, yeah. Uh, but it does take away... Or you don't take away your 3-drop because you've got the torch. Uh, it does take away your ability to kill, say, an Imp Gang boss. 
Uh, no, because you just... You hit it with the four Hit it with your mana worm. And then <laughs> sure, pick. okay, then yeah. you just do it. Okay. Yeah. And having gone through that a lot less clumsily than I did, Zenith decides, yep, yeah, I like that sound of that. And off he goes, creating his 4-3 and turn two. So unless there is exactly Shadow Bolt drawn, well, I guess Peddler, Peddler can give us the Soulfire Dream, I suppose, but... Uh, I think there is, yeah, exactly one Shadow Bolt. We uh, we mourn our dearly departed Dark Bomb in this situation. That's that's what we do. And a second Mana Worm paying a visit now. And, yeah, just manipulating his damage the best way he can, which involves next turn playing a spell. But this turn, taking his time and just casually coming in for five more damage. Yeah, it's an interesting call, actually, because there are two Hellfire in this deck, specifically. There is two Hellfire, one Shadow Flame, so... Um, he, he chose to play pretty hard into the Hellfire there with no minions in hand to back it up. He, he exposed his last minion to on-curve AoE, which should always at least set off an alarm bell in your head. Mm -hmm. You know, Whenever you're playing the last minion from your hand, there should at least be that trigger that goes off and says, okay, this is my last minion. Do I need to play it right now? Um, and into perfectly on-curve Hellfire, I'm not really entirely sure whether he needed to. I fancy that with all the damage he has in hand, if they live... He just fireballs face and starts an unstoppable train. But if he just forgotten torches the face, if his opponent has the card Hellfire in his hand, doesn't he have to Hellfire that one Mana Worm in the first place? I uh, guess so. Although there's cards like uh, Demon, whatever, Wrath, Fire, whatever they're called these days, those cards. Mm -hmm. you can pick it off one on one. So I don't, I don't mind giving him a two Wait, for one. What are we talking about? The the thing that does two damage to things plus mortal coils. I was, I was still halfway through. There's soul fire. Uh, well, none of those cards are in this deck. So. Right. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I don't know. I I'm living the torch face dream that turn and just jamming with the mana worm, keeping that mana worm back in my own hand. That, that's just me. I, I I don't hate the play. Like pushing all in against hellfire is definitely a thing that you 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 do sometimes. What about um, this one? Do you let this minion live? Can it snowball? Or do you just, like, I don't know, play mirror and six to face? Uh, I mean, how much damage do you actually have right now? Um, you have 3, 9, 14, 17 damage, which isn't enough in the first place. Plus, you have to account for at least one burst heal. Uh, this deck plays both Alexstrasza and Jaraxxus. So right. you know you need to... Like, pick up a pile of burn and kill them from 15, not, you know, incrementally deal with them over turns. So, yeah, I think you probably have to continue playing for the board a little bit more. And now the real issue, something that I think is understated in Mage. Like, people say that Ragnaros is bad for Freeze Mage. I think the whole thing is eight health minions are bad for Mage in general. Uh, they often take a lot of resources to, to work out, to get rid of, unless there's a Polymorph or something in a deck. Yeah, I mean, we see even like go going down one stat point, you know, to the, the four mana seven seven in the matchup of Face Shaman is just such a terror against Freeze Mage, for example, mm -hmm. because it comes down so early that, you know, Fireball Ping can't happen, Blood Mage Ping can't happen. All of these things are just incredibly awkward. So, um, you know, scaling that up to an 8 8 where it's out of range of even Fireball Ping, just, yeah, it's just an absolute nightmare. Like this. This is a deck that does struggle to deal with massive amounts of stats. We've seen it previously when there was just a Malagos plopped on the board. Like, <laughs> how how does Tempo Mage kill a 12 health thing if they're not running Polymorph in their deck, which generally they're not? Right, and he chose to deal with it over two turns with the Frostbolt, but now he's getting to the point where he hasn't done any damage to the Handlock particularly. The Handlock's managing to heal, and he's even healing up his minion because it's such a hard minion to deal with. Yep. And can afford to not heal face. This this is often the, the beginning of the end if you're the opponent. It is starting to look a little bit grim here from Zenith. And I, I, I do wonder how much hinges on, on his lack of just raw regression early on. I wonder the, the path this game would have gone down. Because I, I'm pretty sure we would have seen Hellfire come out on that one Mana Worm. And just Zenith be able to refill again with the second Mana Worm on the following turn. So yeah. I do wonder how big an impact that decision has had on the game overall. But, you know, the distance that it looks like Oya has managed to you know, get himself ahead here, it, you know, it, you, you start to wonder whether even that would have been enough, right? Yeah, and, I mean, you're talking there in the past tense already, and I can see why it's um, everything you could want as Oya, basically, given that, you know, at the start of this game, you've just lost two in a row, and 
uh, you're fearing a lot of damage straight to your face. And even when we saw the hands, it's like, okay, Handlock's in real trouble. But that one decision, possibly a turning point. And Zenith just run out of gas. Yep. Just ho haplessly pinging his Acolyte here. Just, just hoping to find some inspiration from his deck. But those Arcane Missiles are about the lowest impact cards he could find right now. Not not able to pair them with a Flame Waker just yet. And he's even going to cash in his Acolyte here. Just trying to dig through his deck even faster. Cult Sorcerer and Azir Drake now means that he has a lot of spell damage piled together, but still not enough to make Arcane Missiles make a dent in, what, 16 health of stats on the board. Yeah, and 16 health. There's not many 16s in 30. That much I know, even as a caster. And, and yeah, a there's, there's, clock. there's even less in 15, Lorinda, and he is just going to put the clock straight back on his opponent Add a brand new 8-8 to this equation of a board that Zenith couldn't clear. And that is an emote that I'm going to take as a sign that Oya's Hamlock has pulled through in the end. He is going to round out our semi-final lineup. Right, so some pretty good action today. Some interesting stuff earlier, but I think that was a good performance. Anyone who's willing to bring Handlock to a tournament is either crazy or good. And we will find out tomorrow which one Oya is. But he seemed like he was pretty good to me. He, he, he impressed me, honestly. He impressed me with the, the the sheer bravery of the man to bring Handlock to a tournament, first and foremost. Um, as I said, it's just not a deck with the amount of historical Handlock experience I had. It's just not a deck that I could get to work for me. And uh, one thing, he, he was playing it, you know, really really tempo focused in in every matchup that we saw him play it there which i think you are just dictated to have to do in the in the matchup because in sorry mm -hmm. in the current meta because generally all the matchups that you're facing are going to be forcing you to do it because it's a very tempo based meta but he was really taking the tempo to extreme you know at no point did we see him sat there with the huge handlock hand of multiple options he was always just sat around four cards five cards in his hand just playing out his options as they came to him. So um, definitely an interesting stylistic choice from him. Handlock, uh, one of the, the standout interesting decks of the tournament for me. But yeah, I think Oya, one of the standout players as well in terms of his overall performance. I can't really think of uh, too many issues that we had with any of his play, which definitely can't be said for too many of the other players in the tournament so far. No, sure. And very going to be very going oh, oh my goodness the words the words have stopped uh, it's going to be very interesting tomorrow to see his progress we will see the two semi-finals and the final tomorrow on play hearthstone and we will again be myself and sottle and the winner will be going to the apac championships at the end of the month and the other seven players or the other three players because they have the semi-finals will not be going there <laughs> so Despite Castamurth not even working for quarterfinals and semifinals, uh, we're hoping to be back tomorrow. We'll hang on just for a moment to make sure that is the end of today. Uh, but we believe that's the last match we're covering today. And as soon as it goes to adverts, we will cut the stream and be back tomorrow at the same time. Yep, so Oya just uh, hanging around on stream waiting for his interview here. He uh, definitely looked delighted at the end as the, the emote and the concede went out from his opponent. But... Um, just as a as a recap of day one, it's 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 definitely a, an interesting little meta shift. It's not it's not a meta revolution by any means. It's just kind of a, a slightly sideways meta shift in Japan. I think would be the best way to describe it. Where a lot of the same decks are strong, but just the fact that uh, Zoo has been kind of shunted out of the the side of the format has made room for a few other decks to creep their way in. Um, you know, a lot more mid-range hunter, for example, which is a, a matchup which they generally need to pack a lot of tech cards to compete with Zoo in that kind of matchup recently. So um, interesting, like Tempo Mage all over the place, Yog Druid all over the place, lots of Dragon Warrior as well. But um, those are those are the common decks. But on top of that, there's definitely a little uh, twist in the Japanese meta as players are bringing their own individual flavor to to the matchups. Yeah, uh, just just agreeing again. Unfortunately, there. Uh, nothing much to add, but that's because I'm busy trying to find out if we have another match. I don't think we do. Uh, we covered you know, two, two pairs of two. We saw the eight players all get introduced for the quarterfinals, and they played in pairs of two matches at a time. Yep. And so that all logically makes sense to the fact that this is going to be the end. Just bear with us for a few more seconds. If it goes to adverts, I'll cut it. If anything crazy happens, I will restart it, but it looks like this is the end. 
And yeah, hopefully see more of the same tomorrow. We have now seen several of the players, so we can begin to tell the stories of how they came through as well. And obviously overnight we'll find out some more bits and pieces for you all. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, we will see you tomorrow, you know, all things barring any miracles with more matches coming up today. I've had a great time. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Yep, see you tomorrow, guys. ここで皆様にお知らせがあります。非配信試合が遅れており、試合が1試合残っております。このステージでもう1試合やってもよろしいですか？ありがとうございます。では、この後ガンダムフレーム選手とマーリン選手の試合をお楽しみください。<笑>